Thanks, Dave. I appreciate that. How are we doing today? Blessed, good, great. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I'm so excited to be able to talk about this. Uh, it'd be the third part of this series about the church. Um, the church is, uh, has been something that I've just been so passionate about probably for the last 10 years or so. Um, not so much before that, which I'll tell you about here. So when I was about 20, 21, I'd give my life to the Lord about 19 and I just was excited. I felt like God was calling me to do ministry, to tell people about him. So I started, you know, the only thing I could do was play guitar, kind of. And so me and some buddies got together and we started playing guitar. And then we, we got, crazy things happened. We like started a college ministry in our campus and we were seeing people get saved. And I'm like, what? Like I was, I was still like kind of like this kid who was just doing tons of dumb stuff. But God just started using me. And using us. And then we started traveling around the area doing a bunch of music. And, and people were coming to know Christ then. And I was like, what is happening here? And I was like, I'm like, oh, man, this is the best. I, I feel like I'm being used. And I feel like God is, like, in my life. And I'm making a difference. This is so great. But there was something that was just, like, kind of just not quite right in my, in my life, in my heart. I had worked at a church for a short period of time when I was, like, 19, 20, uh, which you know, was, I'll tell you about someday, which is hilarious. Um, I'm just like replaying these things in my head right now, actually. But, uh, and, but I, I was reading a book one day because I was just still like not, do you ever feel like you're serving the Lord, but you feel like you're just not quite in that spot? Anyone ever feel that way? Like I'm serving the Lord, I just don't feel like I'm quite there yet. And I, I was reading this book, and at the end of the book, it came down and, and, he, and I read this sentence. And uh, this sentence might make you excited, might make you frustrated. Everyone has a different uh, response to this sentence, but the sentence was is that the local church was the hope of the world. Yeah, that's how I thought too. And when I read it the first time, I honestly started to cry. I was sitting in a coffee shop, and I read this sentence, and I started to cry. And I was like, what is going on with me? Like, what is coming on my face? Like, I didn't know what was happening. It just, like, hit me so hard. In, but then immediately I'm like, not true. That's heresy. Jesus is the hope of the world. And then probably the next day or the day after, I started reading the book of Acts. And I read in Acts chapter 2, um, verse 40, 42. And I'll just read this. You don't have to pull it up or anything. It says, And they devoted themselves, the early church, to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe with the many signs and wonders performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold possessions and property and gave everything they had to those that they needed. That was a need. And, and every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. It sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And the last sentence just like hit me again. It said, the, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And I was like, I don't know about you, like the churches I grew up going to and went to in high school, it didn't quite look like that or feel like that. And it didn't quite like hit me at the moment. It didn't quite, I didn't really see people coming to know Christ every day. I didn't see um, really the church being about other people at all. I really kind of grew up, and I don't know about you, I grew up in a, it was like, well, I want to sing that one again. And I want to sing it five times, not four times. And I'm mad, and I'm leaving. And never verse three. We don't sing verse three. Verse three stinks. We don't like that. Um, I grew up, I grew up, and it was just all kind of about me, the church. And I started to, and I read that sentence, the local church is the hope of the world, and I just, and something in me, like, believed that. But it, everything I had seen, everything I had, had, had been a part of was like, no way, the local church is kind of dysfunctional. And that pastor has weirded me out, man, you know? And, and this, and this, and all the youth kids that are in charge, I see them doing all this other stuff on weekends. It's not adding up for me. And like Dave said a couple, a couple of weeks ago, he said, you know, the church is really about, is really us, right? It's really for us, and it is us. Like, whether we come together today as a church, or we go out into our jobs and our neighborhoods, we're the church there, right? Like, wherever we go, we are the church. And, and, and Jesus has entrusted the church with hope. And Jesus has entrusted us with, as the only redeeming quality of this world. Nothing else can redeem this world but us being like Christ. And so my, my message today is about the church is about others. 
and the church is to expand. I'm really passionate about this. Just get fired up, so just get excited. Uh, if you want to turn your Bible to 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. Sorry, I don't have verses up. But 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. And when I think about the church being about others, we read, we read Jesus, the last thing he says before he leaves, right? He says, go into all the world and what? Make disciples. Does that, does that freak anybody else out as a Christian? Like, that's not just for me or, you know, Dave or just pastors, right? That's for the people of God. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. That, freak, that like, stresses me out. I don't know. I don't know about you because I've been, I've been like, in disi- be, trying to be discipled for you know, 15 years, 16 years. How do we do that? And so 2 Corinthians 2, I want to talk a little bit about this. This really talked about how do we be the redeeming church wherever we go? How do we not just gather here, which is incredible, and we get to sing and lift up the name of Jesus and be strengthened and edified and grow, but how do we do that out there? Anyone else think about that? How do, I do, how do I be like, how do I have this feeling that I have right now of hope and excitement and, and like camaraderie? How do I have that on Tuesday morning at nine? And when my boss comes in my office or someone doesn't do what they're supposed to do and I just don't want to be like Christ at all. I just want to be the opposite of that. Anyone else? That's just me? Oh man, especially this week. Second Corinthians 2. But thanks be to God. So this is the Apostle Paul talking to us, and he's, and he's about to share, he's been sharing about his missionary journeys, his journeys throughout this, the, the, the early church. Um, throughout, this is to the church in Corinth. He's talking about what's going on all over that area. It says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God. Among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death and the other a fragrance from life to life. So the first part of that should give us so much hope. Thanks be to God. In Christ, we lead this triumphant, triumphal procession. That means it's like there's a parade of victory going before you. In Christ, I want us to understand that we have victory today, not just in in the sin and the struggle and the things that go on in our own lives, but we have victory over darkness and what goes on all around us. We have victory in the ability to change the the atmosphere and and the attitudes of the people around us wherever we go. God says that this triumphal procession goes before you, that you don't have to try to, like, make everything great. And make everything right, or make sure you have all the right words to say. You just have to know that God has gone before you, and there's victory and triumph ahead. It's already there. That's what we have with us. That's the beauty of it. We don't have to try to create it. We don't have to try to be really holy, so maybe someone will like Jesus too. Right? I know we laugh at that, but we totally think that way. Man, if I didn't sin last night, if I didn't blow it, if I didn't yell at my kids... Maybe people would come to know Jesus more. <laughs> There's a triumphant procession coming and going before you. And we get to be this, the, the fragrance of Christ to the world. I was in, I was in Greeley this week selling with a, a friend. And uh, we walked up to this house, and they had, like, this beautiful garden. And as I walked into the garden, it just, like, you ever get hit by the smell of the flowers and the, and the plants? And I was like, ooh, that's nice. It's hot, and it's kind of miserable out, and that's refreshing, right? And I also grew up on a, next to a dairy farm. <laughs> and then in North Dakota, where we're from, it would thaw in the spring, and all that would just be, like, you get the point? And it smelled like death. It was like, what? Oh, gosh. My friends would come over and like, this is what your house smells like? I'm like, it's not my house. It's this neighbor. It's the dairy farm. And, and, and God says, like, wherever you go, you get to be the aroma of Christ. And, and you'll bring this aroma of life to those who have life. And you'll bring this aroma of death to those who are on the path to death. And that's not like, yeah, you're going to hell. 
That's not that. But what the Rome of Christ does around people who do not know him yet is it helps them see that I am missing out on something. It, our presence, because we have the Holy Spirit of God in us, should bring about this kind of, what am I doing with my life attitude? It should bring about this, man, I really need, I need this. It should be a realization in people's minds of how far they are from God. And they should be able to see, like, this is the guy or the gal that I can go to and he can help. She can help. To those who are perishing and those who have found life. That's why wherever we go, whether we're here or there, we can edify each other. We can encourage each other. If you're stressed out and you're having a hard day, you can call me, you can call your buddy, and we should be able to, to bring more life. To be, be like Christ, be his presence, be his words, be the, thing that, the things that we need from him in that moment. To those who are far, we get to be that, that, that beacon. We get to be like that flower as you walk into, and they're like, wow. It, it's, it's funny, where I work, I, I always struggle. I'm like, man, am I making a difference here? Am I like being what I say I want to be? And, but whenever things go down, like, you know, somebody's being a jerk or somebody's not doing their job or whatever, I'll get like six calls from all the guys I work with. And I'm not, I am like the lowest man on the totem pole. I have the least authority. I, don't, I can't fix anything. They, and they all say the same thing. I'm just calling get to vent. I'm just calling just to see what you think. And I'm like, I don't, know, I don't even know how to do my job half the time. I'm barely qualified for that job I have. Don't, why are you calling me? And you know what the Lord says? He says, because you are the aroma of my son. And they know, they might not put it together that in this moment I'm going to come to know him, but they know that I can go to him and, he, and it's going to be okay. Things are, I'm going to I'm going to feel better. I'm going to know that something else can happen. And that's what we get to be every day. Because the church is for others. And when Jesus left us, he didn't just leave us, but he empowered us with his Holy Spirit. And then he said, now go and just be like me wherever you go. And the Apostle Paul says something that's so cool. He says, who, this is the next the line, the next line, who is sufficient for these things? Basically saying, who the heck can carry this? Who the, that this responsibility? And you know, I feel like I fail at this. You know, I feel like, man, have I been like Jesus today? I hope so. I think I am. I'm trying to be. Does anyone ever feel like, who's, am I sufficient enough to be like that? Like, I know how messed up I am and broken I feel and, you know, how I'm not always the best guy or gal. And guess what? No one is sufficient for this. None of us can live up to that because we, we're not, we aren't, we aren't, we know we're not holy. We know we're broken. We know that we have things that we're working through. But yet everyone is sufficient for this because in Christ we are made whole and we are made complete and we are made sufficient as his sons and his daughters. And you know what's even more powerful than someone trying to be perfect and being like Christ is someone who's just trying to be themselves and knows that they're broken, but yet is still trying to be themselves, trying to be like Christ in their brokenness, knowing that they don't really have it all together and knowing that they can't really figure it out sometimes, but yet still understanding that God is going before me and I'm being like him and I'm doing my best and God is making a difference around me. Who is sufficient for it? Nobody. But who is sufficient for it? All of us in Christ, as sons and daughters. Because we don't look at our kids and think, wow, I wish you could do that better. You know? Sometimes we do. <laughs> <laughs> like, I wish you would pick that up more. <laughs> I was just, like, again, replaying things in my mind from the week, but... But I, I look at my kids and like, they're just like going for it, right? They're just trying. I always tell my son, as long as you try, I will be happy. As long as you give your best, I'll be happy. If you don't do it or you slack or you're lazy, I will not be happy with that. Because there's more in you than that. Do you ever feel that? I think, I think, the, Lord, I think the Lord's like... You ever feel the push from the Lord? It's not that he's like, man, I wish you were better so you could be more like me. But he says, there's more in you than that. 
I have given you everything. I brought this triumphant parade ahead of you. There's, you can do this. I, you can go ahead. You can go before. And, and, and the people around you are going to know. They're going to feel that. Because you, you're, you're honestly the aroma of Christ wherever you go. And honestly, he, he says that you don't even, it's not, it has nothing to do with what you say, does it? It's everything about who you are. If you ever struggle with what your purpose is in life, what's my purpose? What do I do? How do I figure it out? Like Alex prayed, seeking after God and you'll, you'll get there. It's so true. You understand, that, you understand that you're right where your purpose is supposed to be today. You don't have to search this or read 10, 20 books about it. You should read books. That's good. But you are right where God has you for a purpose today. You have the job that you have to be that aroma of Christ there today. As much as it stinks. As much as people tick you off. There's a reason why you're there. And there's a reason why you're in the family that you're in and your kids act the way they are. Because that's your purpose i got to be like Christ to them. No matter how they respond to me. (laughs) And the places you hang out with and your friends, you're like, man, I need new friends. These guys are idiots. And that's your purpose. Like, I struggled for years about what my purpose was, and I'm like, I think my purpose is every day to just serve Jesus and try to be like him to other people. I think that's pretty much it. Because the church is, is about... It's, it's about us and that we get to do it together, but it's about others because there's people that are far from God, and together we get to bring people in to the family of God. What a great, great opportunity we have to do that. Because you can only get so uh, fixed up in your heart, right? You can only hear so many sermons about how to overcome fear, and you can only, only have so many worshiped experiences that are just so good, and Jesus loves me. I mean, those things are great. There's nothing wrong with them. But if we aren't out, if we aren't understanding today, the people I meet, I have an opportunity to be like Christ with. Because no matter what the face people put on around you, those who are far from God are hurting and far from God, no matter what they come across as. The most strong, confident, career-building, brilliant people there are, no matter what it is, people who are far from God are far from God. And you are the presence of Jesus to them each day for those who don't know who Jesus is. We get to see it through your eyes and through your voice. What a, who is sufficient for that? What a humbling thing. And then he says, for we are not like so many, I love this, this is probably my favorite part, for this, for we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, But we are men of sincerity as commissioned by God. In the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Because you know what I don't like? I don't like insincere peddling of God's word. I'm not a big fan of the guy on the side of the road with the bullhorn or the signs or stuff that just comes across as, eh, I'm not a fan of that. But you, the thing I love about this church is there is a sincerity of heart. That we know what God has done in here and how far we were. And so we can, in sincerity, in truth, with gladness, in, in, perf- in perfection, we can, be, we can be commissioned as those to speak for Christ. I love that. And that's what you're going to find at this church. And as we get going at 23, like my number one thing is that people come and like these people are sincere. This is who they are. He said crap from stage. Wow. You know, that type of stuff. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but that's who we are, right? This is who we, who, that's, and that's what people need. That's the Roman Christ is that I am who I am and the Lord is speaking through me. And it might not look like, what looks like this guy, the other person, but it's hap- there's something happening here, and I'm just myself. And I'm just, I'm just trying to speak, speak like Christ did. My son, I was so proud of my son. You ever have those like, proud dad moments or mom moments? I don't have those all the time, but sometimes I do. 
And the other day he had his first sleepover, and he, eight years old, went to his first sleepover, and mom was nervous. And we're all like, it's okay, it's going to be fine. And he gets back, like, how was it? It was the best. We found 10 rabbits and two snakes, you know, like boy stuff, <laughs> you know. And then halfway through the day, he's like, you know, Mommy, I asked my friend, do you, I asked my friend, do you have Jesus in your heart? And I was like, you asked him that? I'm not sure I would ask anyone that right now, day to day. And he did. He asked him, hey, do you, have, do you have Jesus in your heart? And the kid was like, yeah, I think so. <laughs> Good. Do you go to church? No, we don't go to church. And then I, my son said, he said, mommy, you know, I just, if, if he didn't have Jesus in his heart, I would want to make sure that he did. I'm not telling him, hey, everybody, hey, every day, buddy, you tell all your friends about Jesus. And then he said, because I like Jesus. And I, and I was like, aroma of Christ right there. He's eight years old. He no, doesn't know anything theological. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't stress out about anything. And he just wants his friend to know Jesus. And so my, pr- my prayer for you guys today is that, when, that we would just start to understand that we come together and we have, this, we have a great church. We have, I mean, I've been here a year of my life and it's just like, I come, I'm like, man, you are great people who love the Lord. And I've just challenged you to continue to look at the people that God's putting in your path every single day. That though that's your purpose, that you get an opportunity, maybe not even in a word that you say, but just to be like Christ to them. And when you do that, the church grows. And when you do that, the church expands. Like Daniel said last week, if you have a problem with church growth, you don't probably understand the gospel. Because the, one of the byproducts of the gospel are like tons of people coming to know Jesus and filling up seats and having to expand across regions. That's the byproduct of people living like Christ. So praise the Lord for empty, for full seats and multiple services and multiple campuses. And this is really just the beginning. Praise the Lord for that because that means that we are living out the good news of Christ each day and being the aroma of Christ each day. And we are, have this opportunity to make our lives about others. So we should be so excited about this as we get out of here and a new group comes in and that's going to continue and then beginning of the year when we're, we're worshiping the same time as you're worshiping in Fort Collins and it's expanding across there. We're trying to figure it out, you know. It's going to be just like this. We're going to have these moments of, wow, God. This is what the church can be and this is how the church is the hope of the world because we can impact schools and we can partner with InterVarsity and we can reach Spanish-speaking community here when you reach Fort Collins and beyond that, and there's really no end to it. I'd like to just read kind of a last verse, if that's cool with you. And if we could uh, just kind of close our eyes, and these, these words are from Jesus. Jesus' words for us. When I first, when I first read these words, it was, uh, I really thought, thought that um, Jesus was talking to himself saying that he is salt and he is light, because that's what I was kind of brought up in. But Jesus is speaking these words to us. I pray these would be a commissioning to you to go from this place and start work tomorrow and think of it a little differently. And just know that, like, you know, I might not feel like I have it all together. I might not feel like I know exactly what I'm doing most days. But there is this triumphant processional leading me. And with my sincerity of my love for Jesus... He's going to speak through me. He's going to impact the people around me. And it's going to happen as a natural byproduct of just living out the gospel. So let me read these words to you. Jesus says to us that you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its salty taste, it can not be made salty again. It is good for nothing except to be thrown out and trampled on. As you are the light of this world, 
A city that's built on a hill cannot be hidden. And people cannot hide it under a lit bowl. They are to put it out on a stand so the light shines for all people in the house. In the same way, you should be a light for other people. Live so that they will see the good things you do and will praise your Father in heaven. So Father, we just thank you so much for this morning. Father, we thank you that you are a good, good God. God, thank you that for, for, for those of us who know you, we can come and we can fix our eyes on you. And, and the, the byproduct of us fixing our eyes on you is that we are light and we are salt to this world. So God, I pray that you would increase in each person here, God, the light that comes from us. God, I pray that you would increase in every one of us here, Lord, our saltiness, the taste that we bring the world, the attraction we have to the world. Father, I pray that you just would, would, would speak new things to us. I pray that you would give us new perspectives of the people you've put around us. Because God, your church is about other people. And when the body of Christ works together in our own gifting, in our own sincerity, in our own abilities to go and try to love others like you love them and care for others like you care for them, you do mighty things through that. And that church will expand and it'll grow and it'll go beyond what we ever thought would happen. And not to wave our own flag or to say, look how much we're doing, Lord. But Lord, to declare your glory and declare that you are God and to just to thank you for all you do.